Okay. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Pio Wan Cho will defend the academic thesis, effective symptomology in the prodromal and early stages of dementia, the role of kinetin pathway and systemic inflammation. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis in the next 15 minutes. If you the word. Dear Prorector. Dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and colleagues, thank you for being here today. In the upcoming 13 minutes, I'll present you a summary of my thesis and the research I conducted during my PhD. <clears throat> Dementia is an umbrella term that describes a syndrome characterized by memory loss, uh, language problems, social and problem solving disturbances, and all severe enough to interfere with daily life. Under the umbrella, there are different types of dementia. There are about 50 causes of dementia with Alzheimer's disease being the most common, accounting for 60 to 70% of all dementia cases. However, at this moment, Alzheimer's disease is incurable. And more importantly, Alzheimer's disease remains underdiagnosed, underreported, and the diagnosis is delayed by an average of two to three years after showing symptoms. In simple terms, development of dementia can be broken down into three stages, subjective cognitive de decline, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. Subjective cognitive decline is a relatively new term to in initiate or to indicate patients who experience a subjective decline in memory and other cognitive function, but clinical tests show normal memory function. 
While mild cognitive impairment patients do show cognitive impairment, it is not, it, it is not severe enough to affect their day-to-day -day life, unlike dementia. It is also important to mention that these patients are at a higher risk of converting to the next stage, but not all patients convert. Common pathologies under, believed to underlie Alzheimer's disease are amyloid beta plaques and tau neurofibrillary tangles. Amyloid beta plaques are abnormal clusters of proteins fragment built between nerve cells, while tau neurofibrillary tangles are twisted strands of other proteins that are present in dead and dying neurons. However, amyloid beta plaques and tau neurofibrillary tangle idea has been much challenged by many failed drug trials aimed at these two pathologies. Therefore, the research focus now shifted to other mechanisms such as the chimerian pathway and inflammation. Additionally, studies have shown that affective symptoms such as depressive and anxiety-like symptoms are commonly observed in patients with or at risk of developing dementia and that recent studies point toward a metabolic dysregulation such as the kynurin pathway and inflammation as potential mechanisms that could explain the intricate link between affective and cognitive symptoms. Tryptophan is an amino acid. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Tryptophan is one of nine essential amino acids, meaning that it can only be obtained by food or supplements. The kynurin pathway is the dominant pathway accounting for 90% of all tryptophan metabolism. Certain metabolites, also known as kynurinines, have brain protective properties shown in green, as well as brain toxic properties shown in red. Tryptophan is broken down in the liver to start the kynurin pathway and to produce kynurinines. Additionally, some, pro some tryptophan are transported to the brain and start the kynurin pathway as well. In healthy individuals, there are more brain protective kynurinines than toxic kynurinines. However, next to aging, inflammation, or chronic stress, overactivation of the kynurin pathway has shown to common, are shown to be common in patients with dementia. And this overactivation disturbs the balance to produce more brain toxic kynurinines, causing more damage in the body and starting a vicious cycle of further disbalance. Therefore, the kynurin pathway is a, a new field. Therefore, therefore, there are only a few good studies, and these studies show contradictory findings. Uh, the overall aim of my thesis was to investigate the role of the kynurin pathway and inflammation in the prodomal and early stage of dementia by identifying one, differences in the kynurin pathway metabolite levels between patients with dementia and healthy individuals, Two, differential gene expression and DNA methylation levels in the tryptophan metabolic pathway between patients with and without Alzheimer's disease. And three, associations between kynurin pathway and metabolites and affective symptomology in patients at a risk of developing dementia. And lastly, four, similar association as the previous mentioned, but with inflammation and affective symptomology. Since the role of the kynurin pathway metabolites in dementia is a relative new field, not all clinical studies control for covariates, which might explain the contradictory findings. Therefore, chapter two is the first systematic review and meta-analysis to investigate the kynurinines in cognitive impaired patients and healthy individuals. Since age is the main risk factor for developing dementia, the second aim of the review was to investigate kynurinines in normal aging. We systematically screened over 7,000 articles and found 103 articles that had kynurine measurements in blood, cerebrospinal fluid, post-mortem brain tissue, urine, fecal, and saliva. Of them, 26 studies data had, in, data, had data that could be used for the meta-analysis. The results of our meta-analysis are represented in a forest plot. On the vertical axis, known as the y-axis, shows the different kynurinines that show differences on the, and on the horizontal axis, also known as the x-axis, has shown the kynurinines which were lower or higher in Alzheimer's disease dementia. 
We combined all the single studies into one large meta-analysis and found that lower levels of tryptophan, kinuric acid, centrinic acid, and prelic acid, and quinolinic acids were lower in the Alzheimer's disease dementia. Interestingly, quinolinic acid is known as a brain toxic metabolite, but it seems to be lower in patients with Alzheimer's disease uh, dementia. Next, traditional studies focus on protein and metabolite levels, but there are much more upstream mechanisms that are involved as well. Therefore, in chapter three, we investigate the gene expression and DNA methylation in tryptophan metabolic pathway associated genes. To briefly explain epigenetics, it is the study of how behavior and environmental factors can activate or deactivate genes without changing the DNA sequence. In simple terms, for example, identical twins have same DNA, but as they get older, they show different traits because of, from each other. This is because of epigenetics. And DNA methylation is one mechanism shown in the presentation with, in which the presence or absence of methyl group activates or deactivates gene expression. In chapter three, we first investigated the brains of patients with and without Alzheimer's disease. We first looked at the gene expression, DNA methylation, and computer database to select candidate genes. Then we validate the brain findings in the blood of two different prospective cohorts, HCOD and BBACL. Based on the brain analysis, three candidate genes were selected, IDO2, SLC7A5, and TRP14. These three genes were validated in the blood cohorts, and IDO2 showed a difference in methylation levels between Alzheimer's disease converters and non-converters at baseline. Interestingly, IDO2 is a gene associated with inflammation and one of the first and rate-limiting enzymes to start the kynurin pathway. It is also important to mention that this application is not just limited to this study, but can be used for other mechanisms or even other diseases. As mentioned previously, inflammation seems to be involved in affective and cognitive symptoms, as well as the kynurin pathway. Studies have shown that increased inflammation overactivates the kynurin pathway, which in return influences the affective and cognitive symptoms. Therefore, chapters four and five investigated the associations between the kynurin pathway metabolites and inflammation with affective symptoms in patients with or at risk of developing dementia. We use cross-sectional cord of the BBACL to first measure the kynurin and inflammation markers in the plasma. Furthermore, affective symptoms were evaluated using questionnaires. And lastly, plasma measurements and questionnaires were combined to investigate the association. The main findings of the chapter four is represented here. The x-axis from left to right shows different severity in depressive symptoms, from no depression to severe depression. And the y-axis shows the different levels of kynurinines. Our findings showed that lower kynurinines and its ratios were associated with higher risk of developing depressive symptoms. Chapter five was investigated in a same manner as chapter four. While in chapter five, our findings showed higher levels of inflammation markers were associated with higher risk of showing depressive symptoms. In summary, our systematic review and meta-analysis showed lower levels of brain protective metabolites in Alzheimer's disease, uh, in patients with Alzheimer's disease dementia, there were dysregulations of gene expression and DNA methylation in Alzheimer's disease patients. Finally, decreased level of kynurinines and its ratios were associated with higher risk of showing depressive symptoms, while increase in inflammation showed a higher risk of depressive symptoms. The scientific and societal impact of this thesis were one, kynurinines in combination with current biomarkers of dementia will provide better personalized transdiagnostic tool, and two, kynurine could lead to the development of novel therapeutic drugs to help relieve cognitive and affective symptoms. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I give the word back to the director.
Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. And indeed, you are finished in 30 minutes, which gives the member of the Corona two additional minutes for asking questions. For the audience, I would like to refer that we have six opponents, of which three are online present and three here are on site. Saying this, we're going to start the, the opposition, and the opposition will be opened by Professor Schuurs. He is involved as a professor in mechanism of affective disorders at our university, and I would like to give him the word at the first sight. Thank you, Mr. Prohector. Um, first of all, uh, dear candidate, my congratulations. This is a substantial uh, body of work, not just in, uh, let's say, quantitatively, but really a high quality of studies. And you've even done more studies that are, I understand not even in the book. So I think plenty of good work there. My congratulations to you and to your team of supervisors, obviously. Um, my question or, or the topic I would like to uh, talk to you about today regards the relationship that you find between um, inflammatory markers and um, effective pathology in a group of people who are diagnosed with programmal stages or, or uh, um, with the Alzheimer's disease. Um, and my main question is whether you think that this relationship is specific for this population or that it might be that this is, well, did hold this holds true in other populations as well. One could argue that, well, Alzheimer's disease and its prodromal stages are accompanied by all kinds of inflammatory disorder changes in the brain, but it occurs in different disorders as well. So um, what do you think? Is this something specific to Alzheimer's or do you think this might apply to other inflammatory disorders as well? Yeah. Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. Um, <clears throat> to address that, so inflammation is indeed has shown both in neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, <clears throat> it is um, shown that, uh, so in our study, our patients are indeed dementia or prodromal in early stages. Uh, but of course, inflammation has shown in clinically depressed patients as well, and also in patients with dementia. So, and we know that inflammation and depression is somewhat bi-directional, but, uh, and <clears throat> in that case, uh, dementia was, so in our case, so we corrected for a diagnosis as well in our model, just to see if, if the inflammation is really because of the diagnosis of the patient or is it uh, independent. And ours, we showed that although these patients are, uh, are at a risk of developing dementia or they have dementia, um, our analysis showed that it doesn't matter in our association. So that inflammation is regardless of their cognitive status or diagnosis, um, it was still associated with depressive symptoms. Um, but of course, in order to really validate and find this study, we have to use uh, a different cohort, I believe, um, because our cohort, of course, doesn't have controls. So it's good to have a control uh, patient to really check um, and to see, and also it would be great to have a longitudinal cohort just to verify that is this just a baseline because cross-sectionals are at certain one time point and eventually at that time point might change. So to validate, I think we would have to use a different cohort and also a longitudinal co cohort. And what kind of control group would you choose? So for that, I think um, we would, have to choose patients who are neurologically healthy controls. So people who don't have cognitive impairments or any uh, psychological issues as well. Um, so that uh, it really sees that it's not shifted to a certain uh, disorder or no. symptom. From a theoretical point of view, I follow your reasoning, but I think in practice, you may find that this is very hard to find um, because you will need the, the, what, what was the average age in your sample, for example? So for the men, for patients with SCD, there are around 50. Mm -hmm. um, I think with 
MCIs in dementia, they're around 65, mm -hmm. I think. And the older you become, the older you choose your sample, and what you would have to do as a control sample, the harder it gets to find people that are, so to say, clean. Yeah. That introduces another problem, actually, that you sometimes end up with super normal controls. I know I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm deviating from your your home territory now, and I I, I realize that. So that I, your, your biology isn't this are more clinical questions, but would you mind speculating on that a little bit? Yes. So I think. That is true. So having a, a very solid control or uh, so I think it is very important that in the beginning, when the cohort is being designed, that you have a very clear inclus inclusion and exclusion criteria, and that the goal of the cohort should be cleared or uh, uh, set so that it really addresses the, the question of what you want to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, so in order to do that, of course, all not all every cohort is perfect. So that's why adjusting for covariates, such as what we've done in my thesis, is very important. Um, but of course, ha first having a, a solid design of the cohort. But okay. if that's not possible, uh, then you would have to make sure that there are um, adjusting for covariates and factors and trying to different model okay. to make sure that you validate everything. I'm looking at, do I have time for a little question or do I need to conclude? If you phrase it as a little question, if you phrase it as a little question, yes. Well, I was wondering if you had given any thought to, for example, including um, a brain disorder such as like multiple sclerosis as a control group, which is also chronic inflammatory, known to be associated with effective problems. Uh, so having multiple sclerosis patients as control groups. Was yes, not a healthy control group, obviously. Um, I would have to uh, think about it because uh, multiple sclerosis is an inflammation related mm -hmm. disease. And then of course, if you have them as a control, then they would, uh, it would question some of the findings because mm -hmm. you're based basing your analysis on people who actually have inflammatory disorders. We may have time to discuss this in detail. No, yeah. I'm happy with Thank your you. answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Nolan. Uh, she is affiliated with the Department of Molecular Biology of Aging at University Medical Center in Groningen. And I would like to thank her that she joins us today online. And I'd like to give her the word, Professor Nolan. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, also, I would like to congratulate you first with your uh, impressive thesis. I, I read it with pleasure. It was for me as a biologist working on the Kinurinian pathway, it was very informative to get all this background information and your meta-analysis. Um, of course, uh, I didn't see the, the, your statements uh, when I was reading your thesis, and I was happily surprised to see that you made some provocative statements. So actually, I would like to direct my questions to your statements. And I would like to start with statement number six. And maybe one of your paranymphs could read out this statement out loud. Given the flaws of the amyloid hypothesis, other markers such as inflammatory and metabolic signatures of Alzheimer's disease need to be identified to develop better diagnostic and prognostic tools. Thank you. So my first question about this statement would be, what flaws, uh, biologically spoke, speaking actually, are you talking about of the amyloid hypothesis that disqualify it as a uh, good diagnostic and prognostic tool? And uh, the second question, but I can get back to that later is, how do you think that with the canurinins and the inflammatory markers, you can circumvent similar biological flaws? But first, what are the flaws of the amyloid hypothesis you're referring to? Yes, uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Thank you for your kind words and your question. Um, so in this case, the flaws of the amyloid hypothesis was that uh, this has been looked at almost a century, if I, if I remember correctly. But then, um, and 
scientists and have tried to tackle by uh, our, for reducing amyloid betas and uh, <clears throat> or trying to uh, do the uh, cure by tackling the amyloid beta hypothesis and it hasn't really worked. So my understanding is that yes, it works, but a very short time and then it no, the drug no longer works. Um, so that's what I meant for the flaws of the amyloid beta hypothesis. But as a diagnostic, it is still one of the best that we have uh, currently. But of course, there are always the question of, is the, is the amyloid beta causing Alzheimer's disease or is Alzheimer's disease producing amyloid beta? So, I, so what I wanted to say in this statement is that although we have this uh, very well uh, biomarkers for amyloid beta and tau, that sometimes it's not enough. So especially in the prodomo and early stages of dementia, these are also very uh, low to detect. So that in addition to what we have, that we should have something like the kynurin metabolites or inflammation markers to add upon what we have known to have a better diagnostic and uh, treatment for the patients. Okay, so then coming back to um, whether I agree or not on the on the first part, but to come back to the the timing of of the changes that you would see. So, if I understand you well, if you look at these mild cognitive impairments or or any of these early stages, so you 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 say that there are no change no changes visible in amyloid yet. Still, there are changes visible in the kinurinin pathway and inflammation. Uh, yes. So if I understood your, correct, your question correctly, you asked how is amyloid beta not shown in mild cognitive impairment? And, well, not how is kinurinin? The question is, so you're talking about the flaws and you say for early diagnosis, you need, for example, you need something else, and that could be the kinurin path or inflammation. So, so do you know uh, whether uh, the amyloid pathology is visible at the time where you can already see changes in the kinurin pathway or inflammation? Uh, yes, um, that is a good question. So that I it wasn't uh, in the scope of my research. So. I can't give you a, a solid answer, but um, if I have to educate the guess, I would say that uh, yes. So inflammation uh, has shown in uh, predominant early stages of dementia patients. And of course, um, inflammation and kinerin pathway uh, play along together. Um, so, and then on top of that, small changes in amyloid beta can also induce inflammation. Um, but yes. Uh, well, we can move on to the next uh, yeah. Yes, we can move to the next question because I want to get to the, uh, the first statement, which is statement number one. Uh, if I have time to have that read out and then also ask a question. So can the other uh, paranym read the other the first statement? Cunolytic acid levels are lower in patients with Alzheimer's disease dementia. Therefore, QA is likely to be a major neurotoxic agent in the pathogenesis of AD dementia. Thank you, and and I think you you uh, it's unlikely, right? That's what you state. It's unlikely that cunolytic acid, but. Is that true based on th that the fact that the levels are lower? I was, I was rethinking this. It's not what you write in your thesis. It's not what you show in your thesis and then this statement. So I was wondering, can there be uh, a reason why still quinolytic acid could be a toxic agent in uh, AD? Looking at the biology. Yes, so quinolytic acid can be or is a neurotoxic uh, prop or has a neurotoxic property because of its antagonist uh, activity for NMDA receptors. 
and also for production of uh, reactive oxygen species, mitochondria dysfunction. Um, but, um, well, based on our uh, meta-analysis, uh, we were also very surprised about this. But um, so it, we don't say that they are or they don't have the biological properties of causing uh, neurotoxics. But uh, can I interrupt you here? Uh, but, <laughs> yes. Yeah, because what you show, if I, I look carefully at your graph and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you see that the canerins that you have measured, they all lower. But the quinolinic acid is still higher than most of the other quinerinins that you measure uh, and you, you say they are lower. So, so based on that, if you, if you have the quinerinic acid, which is neuroprotective, quinolinic acid, which is neurotoxic, there's, there's a ratio, or do you think that, that it's not important to take this ratio into account? That's only one argument why I think this statement is maybe too bold, but maybe you prove me wrong. Your question was about the ratio between KAA and QA. Yeah, because yes. in your graph, you yes. see that they both lower. Uh, uh, let me sure. Yes, so um, so having a lower Q, a KA was somewhat we we thought it would look like, uh, but of course, uh, in my other studies, we also showed that although so single metabolites are important to measure, but also having a ratio of KA or QA is as important as having single metabolites, um, so that we shouldn't judge uh, based on single metabolites, but look at the full picture as well. Um, but then for the meta for the meta analysis, uh, we noticed that not many studies actually look at ratios, so we couldn't um, do a meta analysis on the ratio part. But if there were, maybe it might change. Maybe that uh, it would shift slightly, but still on the lower side of the dementia. Uh, but yes, you you are correct that having ratio is as important as. Uh, having single metabolite levels. Okay. Do I have time for other questions? No, there's no time for other questions. I'm sorry <laughs> to say this. I have to interrupt. <laughs> you, you use your full nine minutes. So basically it's one extra already. So thank you very much. You very much. You. And we do have to proceed. And the opposition will be continued by Professor Oude Voshaar. He is a professor in old age psychiatry, also from the University Medical Center in Groningen, and I also like to give him the word. Thank you, uh, dear candidate. First of all, I'd like to congratulate and compliment you with this thesis uh, and your supervisors. It's an impressive uh, work with all the metabolites taken into account comprehensively, uh, so well done. Uh, as a psychi clinical psychiatrist, I would like to go a little bit deeper on chapter five, just like the first opponent. And in, in that, uh, you first argue that inflammation marks have only been examined either in depression or cognition, but you study the association between depression and inflammation within a cohort of cognitively disturbed patients. And we have done the same as being examined that, that uh, association between inflammation and cognition in depressed patients. So it's not definitely the first study, but as you argue in your systematic review, even systematic search will miss 3% uh, of the study. So no problem that you missed one. Um, and I'm interested in late life depression. So my, my first question is a little bit about your sample characteristic, because on page 243, you state that you've excluded all patients with a major depressive disorder according to DSM-4 criteria in the past 12 months. But when you look at table two and you look at the scores on the GDS-15 and the NPI depression score, I can't imagine that all these patients were really excluded because based on the NPI score, uh, 46 percent of the patients who classify as being depressed and on the DDS about 25 percent and these cutoff scores are mostly validated with the 
use of uh, major depression according to DSM criteria. So how is that possible? Can you can you explain that to me? Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. So if I understood correctly, um, you're asking that the patients uh, that are included in this cohort have shown to be uh, or have uh, excluded a depressive or depression and then how is that or how in our, our cohort we have so much with uh, MPI depression scores. Um, yes, yeah, so MPI, MPI is um, informant based questionnaire. So it's not something that is um, a clinically diagnosed depression, but patients or people who are uh, caretakers of the patient answer mm -hmm. the questions. Mm -hmm. So of course it's very subjective. Um, so that would could be the reason why in the MPI depression there are much uh, they're higher than and doesn't look or meet with the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the cohort. Yeah. And if you look at the GDS score, for example, because the cutoff of the GDS has been validated against the DSM criteria, what would be an explanation for that? The, the GDS is also it's a self type or self reported uh, test score or a scale. So of course, um, it's also very subjective to the patient and um, so it's not clinically validated by a clinician. So mm. this is this could be the main reason why um, you have uh, this kind of number. Yeah. And and do you think, if you reason that way, do you think that the depressive symptoms you've measured and the severity is just subclinical? That's a no major depression, or do you think these uh, rating scales can also pick up other symptoms and and might be confounded by other symptoms? So, of course, uh, this is a uh, symptom of our subjective symptom, yeah. and um, and depression is a very uh, complex. Yeah, uh, I, I know. I ask it for I ask it for specific reasons, so maybe I can explain a little bit. If if you look, for example, in the, in the NPI, you looked at one uh, item. But uh, a lot of studies use a factor analysis to look at symptom dimensions. And there's a recent meta-analysis that shows that the NPI has four dimensions. And one of them is the effective symptomatology, with the depression and the apathy item both load on the dimension. And the same, if you look at the GDS, as you look at the factor analysis of the GDS, you have two factors, one pure mood disorder, mood factor, and one dimension of apathy. So could it be that your patients uh, score high on depression because they are more apathic and apathy is often also a symptom of cognitive disorders so could it be just more or less a severity measure of your cognitive disorders or do you think otherwise um yes so indeed um apathy is also very linked with depression but um apathy itself uh, so, of course, our study, we didn't but we'll look at apathy because the question for our research was depressive and anxiety symptoms. Mm. Um, but it, having apathy or correcting for MPI apathy might be the next step just to validate mm. our finding in the GDR. Oh, and it could be an interesting yeah. step. Yeah. And, and I would like to go in your discussion. You. Uh, also uh, discuss the NPI and the GDS, and you say some inconsistent findings between these instruments are uh, interesting, and then you give the advice to use different instruments because of these different findings. But as a clinician, um, what do I have to do? If a patient is depressed on one scale and not depressed on the other, I don't know what I have to do. And I think the same for a researcher. If it is inconsistent, you don't know what's the real. So I would argue, choose the best instrument for your research question or your clinical purpose. And I wonder whether you agree with me. And I wonder whether you have an advice for measuring depression in this sample. Um, yes, so I did mention that uh, there are limitations on both studies and that this limitation could be the reason why 
we have different outcomes in the uh, so I um, as as not since I'm not a clinician, I can't mm. really give you a an uh, an answer on which test to uh, use. But mm. I think that um, yes, for um, so it depends. I, if you want to do a clinical diagnosis of depression, then I would suggest to use more of the clinical side. Um, or both are clinical sites, but of course have a clinician uh, diagnose the patient instead of the patient or the informant to do it. But this, um, but the benefit of having the, these tests are that it's very quick, fast, and uh, it tells you if the patient is at risk of developing depression yeah. or not. And from there, you can go on to the next stage. Yes, so thank, on, so on. thank you very much. I'm happy with your answer, and I'm glad that you also have a role for the clinicians. So I give the word back to the rector. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Dr. De Picker. She was a member of the assessment committee. I would also like to uh, thank her for joining us. She is affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, and I'd like to give her the word. Dr. De Picker. Thank you very much, and my sincere compliments uh, to the candidates and the supervisors for this impressive work, which I read with a great interest. And what I liked in particular was that you have indeed looked at the whole picture, multiple cohorts, different types of samples, different types of analytic methods, different chinurine metabolizing ratios. So I really applaud you for that. Uh, and on the whole, as you've explained uh, in the previous question, you found the kinurinin pathway to be downregulated uh, in dementia, which you expected for the kinurinic acid, but which was unexpected for the kinolinic acid. And in your statement one, which we have heard uh, with the pre previous question, this led you to question the validity of this hypothesis of neurotoxic kinolinic acids in dementia. Now, in our research group, we study kinurinin pathway metabolites in different types of psychiatric disorders, uh, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, etc. And for every disorder that we have studied, we always find exactly the same thing, down-regulated kinurinin pathway across the whole pathway. So we find the same thing as you find, lower kinurinic acid and lower kinolinic acid. And we are really struggling in our group to explain what this means. What does it mean, downregulated kinurinin pathway? And could it be that we are just measuring the wrong thing because we are measuring in peripheral blood and not in the brain? Or should we indeed revisit this hypothesis of neurotoxic and uh, neuroprotective uh, agents? What do you think? Uh, dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. Um, so it is surprising that we do have lower levels of quinolinic acid, but this doesn't mean, or this doesn't question its uh, neural properties. So it still is an agonist for NMDA receptors and still cause ROS, but it just shows that um, there are something that happens uh, additional that can make the, or, uh, the, make the levels lower, um, but um, I don't think, so I think it really requires more research um, to see what what is happening, because a lot of the clinical cohorts we noticed in the meta-analysis are not controlling for covariates. Um, some are uh, different age groups, some have uh, different uh, genders, um, of course, there are other uh, factors that can involve, such as lifestyle and um, cognition. So I think first, so we find that this is the case. So in order to first validate, I think we have to do a little bit more research uh, and make sure that what we find is really what we find of the metabolite itself and not influenced by other factors that could uh, uh, influence the, the levels. Um, and yes, that's... Yeah. Okay, thank you. And that leads me to my next question because uh, 
uh, what you're saying right now about covariates and confounders uh, is very linked or similar to what you've written in statement seven. Maybe we can hear the statement uh, read out loud by one of the paradigms. Association study is only valid when confounding factors are included in the analysis. Yes, I could not agree more. <laughs> um, so, and this is also my idea that there is a lot of uh, covariates and confounders that can influence the results. And some of the covariates that we are aware influence our outcomes are, for instance, the use of psychotropic medications and also the storage time of the samples. But uh, I couldn't find much information about that uh, in your thesis or in the limitation sections. So could you explain a little bit how you dealt with these kinds of covariates in your analysis? Um, yes, so I I couldn't hear uh, properly. So you asked if I corrected for anti-depression. Yeah. For medication, medication use and the storage time of the samples. Storage time. The time they were in the freezer. Ah, yes, so, yes. So, um, yes, so for the VBACL, it wasn't designed to look at depression, but more of a, a dementia and dementia related pre prodomal and early stages. So I believe uh, there, the antidepressant part, or at least for myself, I didn't re uh, receive any antidepressant depression medication information. But of course, if there was the medication information uh, available for my uh, study, then of course I would uh, adjust as well because anti, uh, if you're looking at depressive symptoms and they're taking medication, it would uh, of course not, uh, or it, we would have to uh, correct for it to make sure that it is not the antidepressant effect. Um, Storage time, uh, we, I also did not receive any uh, storage time um, information, uh, but what I understood is that these uh, samples were uh, stored properly um, and then the, they were transported to the company in a proper manner and so on, so that although yes, storage time can uh, make the metabolites different and studies did show, but we tried to minimize this by sending it all at once to the same company, making sure that during the transportation that nothing really happened and so on. But of course, there there is a possibility of uh, some metabolite showing lower or higher because of storage times. Okay, thank you. Is there time for one more question? If not, there is no time for further questions. Okay. Then I will thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued here on site. And I would like to give the next word to Dr. Roadworks. I also would like to welcome her that she took the time to come all the way from Nijmegen to, to Maastricht. Thank you very much. And I would like to give you the word to have some discussions with Mr. Coey. Thank you, Prorector. Dear candidate, first, uh, let me take a moment to compliment you and your supervisory team on this excellent thesis. The work you have done is very thorough and that shows and the hard work you've put in shows as well. And it was a pleasure reading your thesis. Um, I would like to start my questions by focusing on confounding factors, which we already touched upon uh, in relation to um, statement seven. Um, it's something I also wholeheartedly agree with, um, and specifically I'd like to focus on chapter three, where in your discussion you already mention, um, you touch upon the, the limiting effect of using bulk tissue, and to mitigate these effects you've controlled for that by um, correcting for cell type composition in two of the three cohorts you're using, so the MTG cohort and the HQD cohort. Um, now, I am not an expert on tryptophan metabolism, but what I wanted to ask you is whether you are aware of any cell type specific effects uh, relating to this and whether that could influence your results. Um, yes, uh, dear 
esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, kind words and your question. Um, so you, the question was that there are there any cell types specific that can influence the metabolite? Yes. Levels? Yes. So um, yes. So usually, um, micro microglia and astrocytes are the main uh, cell type players that uh, have influence or produce um, kinerin or kinerinines in the brain. Um, so, but also that um, if there is, we've, there's also shown that if you have a blood brain barrier integrity uh, uh, leakage, you can also have peripheral macrophages infiltrating into uh, the brain and producing more of the quinolinic acids and more of the brain toxic metabolites. Um, so yes, uh, and, the, and also neurons can also produce more of the protective uh, metabolite as well. Um, and then we've shown, studies have shown that um, during, so in our findings, we also showed that in CSF, you actually have uh, more kinuric acid than, than lower as if the other way around. So we've, the, the hypothesis was that maybe it's trying to protect by uh, balancing out the high levels of quinolinic acid that's happening or so, and so on. And then also there was shown that patients have higher levels of uh, astrogliosis. So they have more uh, production of astrocytes maybe to try to uh, produce more quinolinic acid. So in that sense, there are some cell types that, are, that play a huge influence in the metabolic production. Mm -hmm. So do you think you could maybe lose information as well by correcting for cell type composition? Or how would you ideally solve that? Um, so for that, uh, yes, I think um, we would have to try a different cohort than uh, in this, uh, in, than the MTG cohort that we have. But in order to, if that's the research question that we want to tackle, that I think it's important that we select or make sure that the tissues have an equal amount of uh, certain cells. Uh, because if you have a bulk tissue, the problem with bulk tissue is that you might have a, one type of cell more than an, another cell type because of uh, apoptosis and so on. So I think it's important that first we check that these bulk tissues have a similar amount of uh, microglia that are astrocytes or neurons. And then look at the measurements to make sure that, yes, it is not the cell that's causing the difference in metabolite levels, but it really is uh, what the production is happening. So. Thank you. And of course, I fully agree with correcting for it rather than not doing it at all. Um, my next question is um, also linked to the lack of overlap that you see in your BBACL cohort and the HCOD cohort. Um, so you're assessing IDO2 methylation at a specific locus, and in the MTG or in the HPOD cohort, you make a comparison of controls versus AD, but then in the BBACL cohort, you've got SCD, MCI, and AD. And I was wondering how you approached this in your analysis. Did you assume a linear association between these three groups? And extending from that is, would you expect there to be a linear association in the methylation and progression from control to eventually AD? Yes. Uh, so, of course, uh, the H CoD was uh, designed so that everyone is healthy and then you have converters. While in BBACL, we don't really have healthy controls, but SCDs. So in order to first tackle this, we did an interaction analysis with uh, the IDO methylation in the BBACL with the diagnosis, just to make sure that there is no interaction amongst the, 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 the three stages. And, that, um, and so that's the correction that we did. The only other correction that we could do uh, do is, of course, all the other ones, the age effects and also all that. Um, so be, I think that it's best to validate by having a cohort that really has a control in AD or, or other stages of dementia, just to make sure that 
um, the findings are in line or not in line with the HCoD and the MTG. Um, but uh, we did try many different uh, statistical models and also tests just to make sure that what we find in the BBACL is correct and it is shown properly. Thank you. Do I have time for one more question? Unfortunately, not. I'm sorry to say this because we do have one final opponent and he was also a member of your assessment committee and I would like to mention Dr. von Boxel. He's affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry and Neuropsychology at our university and I also would like to give him the final words to conclude this, uh, this opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear candidate, I also read your thesis with uh, enthusiasm. Uh, I'm really impressed by your work, also the, yeah, with the work that you did with your co-workers, so congratulations also on your part. Um, and what, what particularly made me uh, um, being fond of, of the thesis was the fact that you did such an impressive and extensive review of the literature and this meta-analysis, which is quite a lot. It's a monograph in itself, you could say. You might even defend your thesis based on that chapter alone. Um, so that was very helpful and also gave me the impression that you really know what you're talking about if you do all these, uh, these studies. Um, but still, I found it difficult to draw straightforward uh, conclusions, particularly based on the empirical chapters that you, uh, that you published, that you wrote. Because, you, uh, because it's cross-sectional in nature, you, you tend to talk about uh, patterns of results. So you try to, and that I think is a good thing if you do cross-sectional studies, but you should be very careful in uh, not to overstretch, uh, overstretch in your results. Eh? You say you have to uh, correct for, for that. You have to uh, do, do um, uh, something with your p-value to make sure that you don't uh, make your time one error. And that's what you do actually, although you could be more conservative perhaps than you, you, you were. So I still uh, I'm still with this feeling of uh, yeah are these what what do these associations actually mean? And at one point you say well you could perhaps get around that that's what you discuss in your general remarks by doing uh, longitudinal research and that's also what you did, hinted at in the beginning of the, the the defense. And I was wondering could you say a little bit more about that? So if you could design an ideal study where you could do longitudinal research really into this pathway. Um, how would you design such a study if you had the money to invest in such a design, yeah. such a study? Uh, dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. So if I had unlimited money and uh, then for longitudinal study, the, I, we would have different time points. So of course for the BBACL, it's cross-sectional now and then we only had uh, biological measurements at baseline. So to improve that, I would have every follow-up. Uh, of course, it's not very uh, nice to the patient, but of course, try to get blood and CSF and also make sure that um, tryptophan or the day before they fast, because tryptophan, of course, is a essential amino acid. So uh, you don't want to have the, the factor that because they had certain type of meal the day before the blood or the CSF was drawn that influences the tryptophan levels. Um, so I would say have biological measurements every time they follow up, have a clinical uh, assessment as we have now. So the BBACL itself, every follow-up still does cognitive and affective uh, tests. So have that and uh, make sure that and then try to also see a simple con a similar concept as H -D to make sure start that uh, they all start in control or or if they don't then we want to see how long does it take for them to convert and it, at baseline do you already see a difference between metabolite levels between converters and non-converters or is this something that happens progressively and so on or are there certain metabolites that or inflammation markers that can do it in the beginning. So let's try to as a detect, detection way or not. So I think long, longitudinally, you would uh, have to have as many markers and as many measurements as you can get uh, without uh, 
discomforting the patient too much. Yeah, so that's a kind of an equilibrium that you yes. need to. Uh, yeah. Okay. And um, but there was also an, an interesting uh, proposition that you have about this uh, topic, and that's proposition number four. Perhaps one of the uh, prior names can read that aloud. Proposition four. Poorly designed and biased studies have led to contradictory findings, spurious associations, and wrong conclusions regarding the role of Q neurons in dementia. So my first thoughts were when I read this uh, proposition was that yeah, you cannot really disagree with that. Right? That's, but it, yeah, in your opinion, it's typical for the field uh, on, on this kidney neurons uh, pathway that there is some some clouding of of uh, the, the findings. Huh? So if you um, would give some advice. Um, in what respect could these cross-sectional cross designs be improved if you would do this, for example, the next time, or if other researchers would do a study like this in the future? In what respect could that be improved? So the main factors of the, the kinerinines are, of course, age. So there is an age association. So you want to have a very similar or non uh, significant difference in age population. You also want, so gender is a big thing as well. So of course you want to have a, a equal amount of uh, both genders. Mm -hmm. So men has shown to have more tryptophan levels than female. Uh, so then you want to have an equal amount of gender or look at one gender specific, uh, just to uh, make sure. You also have uh, lifestyles and smoking and drinking and Although, so you want to make sure that, so I think it is important that first we have to find out what influences the kinerin pathway and its metabolite. Then based on there, we would uh, design a cohort that uh, answers and brings the association, uh, or validate the association so that you have a true finding of the metabolite effect and not something that is influenced by covariates and so on. Hmm. So in a way, you suggest that you should make these designs a bit more specific. Yes. Uh, but that could be at the cost of external validity, potentially, yeah, of your, your findings. Is that what you propose, or do you want to keep it general? So, well, well I think it's important. Well, I think the first thing is, what is this core designed for? Do you want it something? A generic so that everyone can use okay. it or do you want it specifically just for your research question um and then from there i think we have to... of course uh, mr koi you are you are allowed to uh, finish your answer to uh, your opponent yes so i think that's that's the main thing that i would first design is is it for a generic for a person who or for everyone that can use or is it specifically designed for the kinerin pathway and if it's so uh, then you have to of course have factors that influence and adjust for those uh, if not then if you have the generic version then you do as much uh, covariate adjustment as you can just so that your associations are what it tells you thank you thank you very much mr Cohen. the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and in addition, and in particular, the way you have defended your thesis this afternoon. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return to this room. Thank you very much.
Dear Mr. Koi, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Okay. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and in particular the way you have defended your thesis in the last 45 minutes. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you officially the degree of doctor. Professor Rutten is authorized to confirm you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs. And therefore I would like to invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Huang Mam Churi, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by customer law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. So I will pass the word for the laudatio to my two of the three other members of the promotional team, uh, Dr. Kenis and Professor Van Hoel. I just wanted to add, I wanted to take the liberty to provide you with an additional, not a title, but a name. Uh, and, and I wanted to name you, your middle name, Connecto, which I looked up. That means in Korean language, bridge. And I think you're a connecting person, a connecting person between Korea and the Netherlands, and Maastricht and the Research Institute in Korea, but particularly also here locally, as you were one of the two PhD students on the transdivisional project, which is very com complex and difficult to set up and to execute. And you were also connecting people and research disciplines. So therefore, I think we now not only uh, title you now with doctor, but I think I would like to propose to also take this word connector, not really sure whether I pronounced it correctly, into your name. Uh, and with that, I want to pass on the word to Dr. Kenis. Thank you very much. Dear Chris, so here you are, <laughs> Dr. Koi. Um, four years of hard work now sealed with uh, this magnificent thesis and the degree of uh, PhD. Yes, you worked very hard for that. And uh, for that, I would like to already congratulate you. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, your family is uh, following this uh, on live stream and uh, your family now is uh, partly present uh, here. So uh, you're coming all the way from South Korea. You first had some time in the US, finally ending up here in, in a PhD position. So you are quite a adventurous guy. And maybe that's part of the reason why you took up this challenging project, as uh, Professor Rito just said. It is a quite a challenge to, to, to take up such a multidisciplinary uh, project. And um, you were not alone uh, in this, uh, and you also Rito Bakker uh, um, certainly was also involved in this uh, endeavor in this transdivisional uh, project. So, um, you, you can see that we are here with uh, four supervisors and actually the whole team in addition was also Ile Raamakers and Simone Euse and Professor Frans Verheijs. So actually you had six or seven supervisors. So six or seven supervisors, that could mean that you are hard to manage PhD students requiring seven supervisors. But of course, that is uh, not true. Let me refute that immediately because uh, you were always meticulously prepared in everything that, that you were doing, uh, which was also very needed for in, in view of this project. In every meeting that we had with you, you had a nice PowerPoint with all the agenda points <laughs> worked out in, in, in a lot of detail. 
Um, also in the lab, we were very well uh, prepared. We checked the data two, three times all the time. So you are really sure that what you were presenting was, was correct. So um, you, you worked uh, very hard and, and, and very well. Now, the reason why we are here with, with, with four and even more supervisors is the multidisciplinary nature of your project. And that, of course, comes with some challenges. Um, and it was also acknowledged by many of the opponents here today that uh, the project is so diverse and that is and, and not easy. And they were really impressed by the way that you answered uh, the questions, which extended partly also your uh, particular domain of expertise. So again, congratulations uh, um, uh, for that. Um, now the challenges of course that you have is that you have to deal with all these uh, professors with all their expertise uh, with all their working styles different disciplines that by itself is a challenge but you did that very well um, also i think because of your polite and kind nature uh, but also to be a bit a little bit insistent um, i remember also that we had a lot of meetings and that you said well i wrote an email to professor x and he has not replied yet it was yesterday. Can I already send a reminder? <laughs> so this kind of insistence likely also is needed, of course, to get this this, this project uh, uh, going. So um, we are very happy that that, that you uh, uh, did all this, this this work with us, and uh, I think I, um, you have produced a very um, good thesis, a very magnificent thesis, of which also the scientific implications cannot be uh, un underestimated. So let me also um, um, yeah, you, you also, of course, uh, had a lot of time, time pressure, which is what I would like to say, because you, you can manage many things here, but things can go, go wrong, uh, even without, uh, well, you, you cannot uh, avoid it. The Corona crisis, crisis uh, struck. Um, that, of course, is for all PSD students uh, an, an issue. Uh, but certainly when you were starting with your big measurements, which you were planning for months, then we had to close the lab and that certainly I gave you time delay undetermined and you had a lot of time pressure because you were required to go back to your country to do your civil duties there as well. Um, luckily also uh, Haley was here to, to help you also in finishing finally the, the administrative work of, of your project and uh, well, uh, luckily you were able to write part of your thesis still uh, in Korea. So you should be very proud uh, of, of your achievements. And uh, I think that also uh, your family um, can share in the pride of these achievements. And I would like to congratulate first your wife, Haley, and your family-in-law, and also your family uh, online uh, in South Korea. So on behalf of the whole team, congratulations again. And I short give the word to Professor Hanover. Thanks, Gunther. Uh, always when you say I keep it short, um, I get scared. Um, what more to add, Chris? Well, uh, also on my behalf, congratulations to you and your family. Um, maybe just two more things to add. First, uh, what I appreciated that I've also uh, witnessed your inner discussions on how to deal with intercultural differences um, in relation to academia. So including issues like hierarchy, the word already came up before, hierarchy within academia, but also beyond within societies as a whole. And you, in fact, dealt with several countries in this respect before, having spent time in Germany, um, Qatar, France, um, but also the US and, of course, Korea. And now we are moving back again uh, to Korea. It's utterly complicated, but I think you're doing a great job in trying to combine the best of all worlds uh, in, in, in this respect. And you try to fit all these academic differences, but also societal and cultural differences into a working model, an academic working model that you wish in the end to implement in your home country, Korea. And I think that's a beautiful ambition, I would say. Now, second are your social skills, which are very important in this respect as well. I think you learned a lot in terms of approaching other scientists professionally over the past few years, but in terms of approaching colleagues socially, nobody needed to learn you or teach you anything. Um, you are generally interested in others, I, I, I would say, 
now out of field and your social skills have always, I think, been well appreciated within our group and the school men's uh, as a whole. Everybody knows you as the lunch guy and you're always extremely kind to others. And what goes around comes around, I often say, and the evidence is out there. I know these people tend to first look at the acknowledgement section when they finally get hold of a paperback version of the thesis and have a look at it. In the short time that you spend here, particularly keeping in mind uh, the COVID-19 crisis, you made a lot of friends. Um, and I think that's an impressive, particularly as I said, with the pandemic being around. So that shows that you're not just smart, but you're also very kind. So I wish you a lot of fun uh, and good luck on your seemingly everlasting journey around this globe. And I wish you good luck in making this world a better place. Give the word back to the program. Now, first, we have to make an applause for the Laudatio. So, Dr. Gori, how does, it, how does it feel to be named doctor? I think it sounds good to you. Yes, I know it. Also, on, on behalf of the Board of Deans of our university, I would like to congratulate you with this new title and looking forward to see your progress in the future in your career and career. I will also bring my congratulations to your family who are sitting here, also congratulations. And of course, to the promotion team. And it was a big promotion team, but of course it's a translational project, which also needs a lot of emphasis and that's it's, it's quite, quite correct. Saying this, we're going to conclude. Um, we're going to still to make a picture, but before conclusion, I use my hammer, which I have here officially, and I said this ceremony is officially closed. How do we proceed? Now, we're going to make a picture here with the team on this.